you know, thought just occurred to me. History has a weird way of repeating itself. And I'm going to sh tell you something that you might not have heard. I just came up with this by myself. I didn't internet cheat it. And I didn't listen to the radio or watch the TV to find out this incredible comparison. Okay? So hear me out. Seven years ago, I did my first ever post-game blog for football on this very channel. Okay? You might remember because I was very emotional. It's one of my highest rated videos ever. Maybe it's because oh, you lost. I, I don't know. But nevertheless, that day at a professional football stadium, which in that case happened to be Cowboy Stadium in Arlington, Oklahoma ranked third, returning an All-American quarterback, kind of like what the series have done this year, returning an All-American QB in Baker Mayfield. But seven years ago, it was Sam Bradford playing a top 25 team. Of course, it was BYU seven years ago. Of course, it was Houston, top 25 team this year. But just like in the BYU game, in today's game against Houston, Oklahoma was a double-digit favorite. And of course, Oklahoma playing Houston in a professional sports stadium. or Lions Stadium where the Houston Texans play. OU was expected to win and win comfortably in both games, returning an All-American quarterback. And in both games, Oklahoma, ranked third in the country in both years, lose. And the most dominant player on the field happened to be the opposition's quarterback. Seven years ago, it was Max Hall for BYU. And today, Greg Ward Jr. of Houston. Like I said, history has a weird way of repeating itself in so many ways. And when you look at the difference between the two teams, you look at one team that was prepared, one team that was really treating this like a college football playoff game, and the other that treated it like it was just another Saturday and, you know, kind of went through the motions. Again, not taking anything away from the Cougars, because anybody who thought that Houston was like Los Del Rio, Macarena, or like AHA and Take On Me, in other words, if you thought they were a one-hit wonder, uh, no, you're incorrect, because... Tom Herman coaching them, they're, they're definitely going to be around, and they have an opportunity this year to run the table. If they can handle the rest of the AAC, and if they could beat uh, Louisville, now a conference opponent, and if Houston can win the AAC championship, the committee's going to have a hard time denying a 13-0 team an opportunity to get a playoff spot, even if they are not a Power 5 conference team. So, something to keep in mind. And Houston today, you know, they overcame – the early deficit that Oklahoma had administered. And you might remember early on in the game, hey, it was like a work of art, the opening possession for the Sooners, you know, did a lot of great things and, you know, didn't take them long to score and go up 7 nothing. But one thing that we noticed that in the early going, the defense did no favors at all to the offense, okay? One way that you control an effective offense like Oklahoma's, you don't let them on the field. You keep them on the sideline and you make them spectators rather than participants. Sooners in that first half only had 10 minutes plus of time of possession. Defense was on the field for nearly 20 minutes. That's a near a 2-to-1 ratio, and that's sickening. But Houston deserves a lot of credit for that. Third down, the money down in the game. And if you're the defense, you know that third down has to be your down. Force a punt, or worst-case scenario, a field goal. They're getting close to the goal line, and at times Oklahoma did that. But there are other times, too, where... Houston had the ball in their own territory. There were some third and longs, and Greg Ward Jr. didn't hurt Oklahoma with his feet today. Multi-divisional quarterbacks will do that, but today he was effective when he had to be on third down with those conversions and keeping the chains moving and keeping Oklahoma's terrific offense away from the field. And that really hurt a lot. So you might be thinking, well, okay, so Houston, I know that, that Dakota Austin was getting burned today. You know, he had a really, really rough day, and it got so bad that but Mike Stoops, you know, early on had to put Parrish Cobb in the game to try to, you know, change things up, you know, get something different going. But, you know, that was a battle too. So, you know, I would expect that Parrish Cobb's playing time is going to increase a lot unless, you know, we see um, Dakota Austin get better. Because today uh, he was bad. He, he was getting uh, the bullseye target um toward his direction. Um, you know, Stephen Dunbar had a big game today, but then again, the Houston receivers all had nice days, and Greg Ward Jr. really made them look good. And, you know, Greg Ward Jr. is not a one-year flash in the pan either. He's going to have another fantastic season by all accounts. 
Um, but the defense really today in the first half did the OU offense no favor. Because remember the first two possessions, you know, Oklahoma looked good. Um, and even though they didn't have the ball very long, they were effective. First eight and a half minutes of the game, the Sooners had the ball. And they, um, you know, they had over 150 yards of total offense. Pretty good. Of course, the second possession, they melt in the red zone. They melt close and have to settle for a field goal. Um, the big thing about the Sooner offense, as you notice today, the ground game, there hardly was one. And I don't know if it was because they loved the passing game so much or because of P. Ryan getting hurt early on. When, and I know that we saw P. Ryan later in the game, but but it, we, we hardly ever saw him on back-to-back -back possessions. That, that was one thing I noticed. And Joe Mixon, for as good as he is, is not the same type of back as P. Ryan, not the type of back that it appears that the coaches for, for the Sooners offensive staff don't want to give him the ball, at least rushing-wise, you know, quite a few times. They don't want to make him a 15-20 to 20 type carry back. And I, I think that's why you saw the passing game a lot more, and maybe that played into Houston's hands, and maybe they knew they, to expect pass a lot more often, and they could prepare for that. Maybe maybe that's part of it. Mayfield today, if you look at his stats, were actually good. I mean, he was 23 of 32, and he didn't throw a single incomplete pass in the opening half. And he didn't have any interceptions for the game, and he had over 300 yards Passing. So if you just look at his stat sheet alone, you thought, you know, he played like a Heisman Trophy winner. Okay, and he did not have a bad game at all. But, um, you know, the second half, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, wasn't quite the same as the first half for him. Um, and I can say that about the entire Oklahoma offense for the second half as opposed to the first, okay? Uh, of course, some of the big moments in this game, as I look back on them, the big moment, number one, would have to be when the Sooners, you know, are up 10-6, to 6, and this is just their third possession of the game, and they get nine yards on the first play. They got second and one. You got second and one, and you can't get a yard on second or third down. You got a punt. If you can't get a yard on second or third down, two tries to get a yard, there's problems. There are problems right there. So there was a there, there was one indication uh, right there that maybe um, uh, it was going to be a little bit rough going for the OU offense from that particular point. Key moment number two. OU is up 17-16. to They're in a nail-biter against the Cougars. But, third and long, Houston's got the ball with under a minute to go. Third and long from about the Houston 20-21 yard line. And Oklahoma has finally forced a punt. They finally forced a punt. But hold on. Roughing the passer on Okurinquo. Ouch. That was a dagger right there because you don't rough the passer. It's going to be fourth down. About 40 seconds to go, and this was the half in which OU did not have timeout difficulty. They had their timeouts, and they were going to force Houston to punt deeper in their own end, and the Sooners were going to have an opportunity for one last drive and maybe get a touchdown, worst-case scenario, field goal. But instead, penalty keeps the Houston drive going, and the final play of the half, guess what? Long field goal. So Houston is winning 19-17 to at halftime, and that was a big, big moment in the game. And, of course, the big moment, number three, after the Sooners start the half defensively by forcing three and out, which they had not done. They had not forced a punt at all in the game up until that point early in the third quarter. Oklahoma gets it back, moving it into Houston territory, but got fourth down, and it's going to be a 53-yard field goal if they attempt it. And they've already burned one timeout. So, you know what? We're going to burn a second timeout. And this was the moment during that second timeout that was burned by Bob Stoops that Tom Herman – sends the return team in to defend the field goal, okay? Now, you might remember Auburn, Alabama, three years ago, one of the greatest games ever played in the final play of the game when Alabama tried the long field goal, was short, and Chris Davis ran it back 109 yards for a touchdown. Guess what? Same thing's going to happen here because it's not like Houston knew that they were going to return a missed field goal for a touchdown, but they were prepared for it. And boy, were they ever. For Austin Seibert. It's short, and here's Brandon Wilson returning it. Wilson past the 30, past the 40. Wilson might take it all the way. He hurdles his own man and takes it home. Touchdown, Houston. He hits toward the right sideline after he catches the Seifert field goal that's short, and he's got a wall of blockers, and all Oklahoma has, by and large, are... Big, slow linemen who are going to try to catch him. Ha ha, not going to happen. And 
it ends up being a 26 to 17 lead. Houston goes up nine points, and it's a two possession lead. The Houston crowd is absolutely going berserk. It's louder than it's ever been for their fan base in this game. And you had a feeling that at that point in the game, the way the players reacted and the way that they played the next, probably next quarter, next 15 minutes, that someone took their hand and put it in every one of the Sooners' chest, took their heart out, and flushed it down the toilet. Because it affected Oklahoma that much. It affected them to where they would not get themselves in the position for another score until very late in the game when, it was or, when they were already down 16 points. And by the time they did score a touchdown late, they had to get a two-point conversion. They couldn't get it, and that was pretty much that. Um, yeah, the, the final score of 33-23 could have been worse. Of course, it didn't really matter because you, you lose, you lose. And in this case, it was a decisive loss for the, for the Sooners anyway. But you remember, 33-17, Houston has an opportunity to uh, to punch another score in late, and that's when they fumbled, and um, Will Johnson recovers in the end zone, and the Sears get it back and march it downfield. But there was too little time left, and of course you burn two timeouts, in my opinion, unnecessarily early in that second half, and you kind of really hurt yourself. I thought, you know, one good thing about this game, Mark Andrews. You know, it seems like any time he catches the ball, big plays happen, and I think he scores touchdowns 40 to 45 percent of the time he catches a pass in his career. And I'm not saying he'll continue to do that, but I think they got to use him more often. you got to use Mark Andrews more often as a receiver. He's very effective, a tall target, and he's already done some great things in his career, and he's just a sophomore. So, you know, I, I think that Mayfield needs to use him more on a regular basis. The two fumbles were killers, of course, in that second half after the great Mayfield scramble in the third when they were down nine points, and Baxter catches the pass but fumbles, um, fumbles at midfield. Houston gets it and then would score on the next drive. And then Mayfield had a uh, fumble after getting sacked. So here's the thing, okay, everybody. This season's not over yet. I'm not going to count Oklahoma out. I am going to say, though, that, you know, you're going to have to beat Ohio State, who's pretty damn good, okay? You're going to have to beat TCU. They're good. You're going to have to beat them on the road. And you're going to have to finally show that you want to win the Red River Shootout more than Texas, which the last three years, Oklahoma hasn't shown that they have that ability to do that. They don't have that that fortitude to do that. That's going to have to change. You got to win at Tech. You got to win at home against West. Uh, you got to win at West Virginia, and you got to be able to beat a high-scoring Baylor team. And you got to be able to beat Oklahoma State, who's high-scoring too, at the end of this season. You got to win all those games. You can't mess up, and even then, you're still not guaranteed a spot in the college football playoff. Eleven to one, best case scenario. The Big 12 today took a bit of a hit with Houston from the AAC, a group of five conference, but its best team from that conference showed that they belong with the big boys of college football. So congrats to Tom Herman and the, and the Cougars. They deserved it as they beat my Sooners, and uh, they beat them in convincing fashion, in my opinion. I'll have pregame of Louisiana, Monroe, and my Sooners coming up probably on Wednesday so make sure to check back with us. Oklahoma, season's not over, but you couldn't have asked for a worse start for the 2016 season. We'll see if my Sooners can pick themselves up from the canvas and give a damn about the remainder of 2016. That's the start now, though. No more, no more mulligans. Take it easy.